Hello Internet, my name is Patrick and this is Fringeworthy, a show where I talk to you about weird magic decks. And today we're going to be talking about the deck that I took to the GP Seattle 2018 Legacy Main Event. And that deck is Nixfit. Now, Nixfit started, as far as I can tell, as a deck about a year ago, where the main combo was Academy Rector, Diabolic Intent, Omniscience, and Emrakul. It's since morphed into its current version, and I'm going to go deep into why I think it's a well-positioned deck and why I brought it to GP Seattle. I'm also going to cover all of the matchups that I went through while I was playing it. So, let's take a look at the deck. So here's the Nixfic list that I settled on. There's a little bit of variance you can find through most people's lists here, but for the most part this seems pretty standard. The spicy edition that I have I'll talk about in a bit. Now, the main way that Nickfit and Nixfit work are by using Veteran Explorer to ramp out mana ridiculously fast. The fastest and most reliable way we do this is by sacrificing them to Flashback Cabal Therapy. We can also use that same sacrifice on the Cabal Therapy Flashback to sacrifice our Academy Rectors. The thing to note about Academy Rector is that it has an intervening if clause. When it dies, its ability triggers and is put on the stack, and your opponent can respond. If they do respond in some way that removes Academy Rector from your graveyard, the rest of the ability doesn't resolve. This means that if they use Deathrite Shaman or Surgical Extraction, you won't be able to go get an enchantment from your deck. Thus, you must be very careful when sacrificing Academy Rector if they have access to either of those cards. When playing around isn't possible, we've got some options in the sideboard to help out, but more on that later. Besides Cabal Therapy, we have a lot of other sacrifice options. We're running a Phyrexian Tower, which gets us more mana. The other main sack engine that we have in the deck is Evolutionary Leap. Since Evolutionary Leap essentially gets a random creature from our deck, and the deck only runs 4 Veteran Explorers, 4 Academy Rectors, and a single Dryad Arbor, that means we have a very high likelihood of hitting either a Veteran Explorer or an Academy Rector, especially if we fetched our Dryad Arbor earlier. If we sack a Veteran Explorer to Evolutionary Leap, we should always strive to get two forests. This way, if we hit another Veteran Explorer, we'll have enough mana to cast and then sack the new Veteran Explorer. This chaining of Evolutionary Leaps allows us to get closer to our end goal of sacrificing an Academy Rector to get a big enchantment. The deck also has a few auxiliary sack outlets, Diabolic Intent and Garuk Relentless. Sure, Garuk Relentless can kill our creatures on the front face, but the real place where he does work is on the back side, where his minus one can let us sack a creature to tutor for any creature in our deck. Now here's where we get to the real meat of the deck. These are the four enchantments we are most likely to get with our Academy Rectors. First up, we have Overwhelming Splendor, aka One-Sided Super Humility. It slices, it dices, it one ones your opponent's creatures, it stops them from activating other non-mana and non-loyalty abilities, it turns off equipment, it turns off fetch lands, it turns off wasteland, it turns off aether vial. It does so much at preventing our opponents from doing so many things. It is highly punishing to most legacy decks. But what about spell-based decks? I'm glad you asked. For that we have Dovescape. It turns non-creature spells into birds. This is a symmetrical effect, so it's usually one of the things we want to go with last. But if we do have to play it early, keep in mind that we have much bigger spells and access to spells with X in their mana cost. Now seeing as our deck is a little bit light on creatures, it's very possible that they could still overwhelm us with a swarm of 1-1s. For this, we have Curse of Death's Hold to very efficiently kill all of their creatures. Now the fourth and final lock piece pulls double duty. Curse of Death's Hold deals with any resolved planeswalkers our opponents might have, and secondly, it puts a clock on them that they'll be dead within usually four turns or fewer. Now I'm running an additional zesty lock combo of Living Plane and Curse of Death's Hold. A few things to note about this combo. First, Living Plane is expensive, so thanks to my friend James, a fellow Nixfit pilot, for letting me borrow it. Secondly, we always want to make sure we get Curse of Death's Hold first. It would be really bad to get overwhelmed by our opponent's 1-1 lands, or giving them an opportunity to blow up our lands which are now creatures. Thirdly, if we have Curse of Death's Hold out and we get an Academy Rector trigger to go get Living Plane, by time they know we have gotten Living Plane, our opponents can't float mana. Their creatures will be dead before that happens. It's very important important to not use this combo as a way to get back onto the board, because it doesn't help against already resolved threats, but it will prevent our opponent from casting anymore. 
Now some of the other cards we have here are Lingering Souls. This helps us get some more creatures that we can sack to any of our sack effects and get some value from them. Additionally, we have Collective Brutality. Brutality does a lot of things for us. It gives us more information about our opponent's hand so we can more effectively Cabal Therapy them. It also can be used auxiliarily to kill our own creatures or our opponent's creatures, and it can drain some life to give us a little bit more breathing room. The dream use of Escalating Collective Brutality is discarding Lingering Souls. We also run some other card advantage stuff here. We've got Green Sun Zenith, which can be used to get out a Dryad Arbor to Mana Ramp, or can be used to get out our Veteran Explorers if we're missing one. And Sylvan Library helps us dig deep into the deck in case we ever run out of gas. As for our Plane Chain removal, we've got Abrupt Decays, which are uncounterable and can deal with Chalice of the Voids, and Pernicious Deeds, which are fetchable by Academy Erectors if we need to, and can blow up a wide variety of things that aren't Planeswalkers. Here's what I had for my land base. Now, if money was no object to me, I would probably up to two bayous and two savannas, cutting one of each of the corresponding fetch lands. If I were to drive anything home about the mana base, it would be this. First of all, Bayou is the most important tool that you can have for this deck to make it much better, and secondly, having a variety of fetches is important for not getting Pithing Needled or Sorcerer's Spyglassed. Now let's talk about the sideboard. I've got Cast Out in the sideboard as sort of a, a sort of spicy addition for a catch-all for removing permanents. The main times I would bring in Cast Out is to be other prison pieces or to deal with Planeswalkers, since that's one of the things this deck struggles the most with. Choke deals with decks that have islands, and Gaddic Teague will turn off most combo decks, which are a huge threat, and also can turn off Force of Will, which is sometimes very useful. Moving along, we've got Golgari Charm. The main reason for Golgari Charm to be here is to destroy enemy enchantments. This is mostly to get rid of Rest in Peace or Leyland of the Void that our opponents might have. The side benefit is being able to give all creatures minus one minus one, which is a great way at killing our veteran explorers in a pinch, or dealing with some of their creatures if we have an early overwhelming splendor in play. Thoughtseize is there to shore up our combo matchups, which are some of the weakest, and Ground Seal is there to protect our cards in the graveyard from being interacted with. This means with a Ground Seal in play, we don't have to worry about our opponents being able to remove our Academy Rectors in response to the Exile turn. It also turns off Deathrite Shaman. We run some of our own Ley Lines here, mostly because they can come in for free or they're fetchable off of our Academy Rectors. Ley Line of Sanctity is mostly here for burn, and Ley Line of the Void to deal with graveyard combo. Lastly are two situational, toolboxy sorts of enchantments. First up we have Sandworm Convergence, which is one of the other common finishers you'll see in other Nyx Fit decks. It'll be commonly run alongside Moat to prevent any attacks when both are out, but Moat is expensive in terms of real-world money. Additionally, I have Starfield of Nyx in here. It's another alternate win condition by animating all of our enchantments, but it also gets back enchantments from Graveyard to play. This is especially useful if our opponent's main way of disrupting us is by discard. Now let's talk about some matchups. In the first round of GP Seattle, I played against Punishing Thieves. This was the closest thing to a, a pile deck that I ended up playing against, and it ended up going pretty well for me. We ended up going to time, but I handily won the first game and was close to winning the second one. I just stabilized when we ran out of time. This deck is pretty good, it has a very greedy mana base that we can go after. The one part that makes this a problem for us is the deck has multiple ways of winning. They can win through creature combat, they can win through punishing fire loops, and they've got lots of control options. This means that we really need all four pieces of our enchantment lock to be able to lock them out. Ground Seal comes in to protect our graveyard from Deathrite Shaman and Surgical Extraction. Choke comes in because they have islands. Gaddic Teague comes in to turn off Force of Will and any other big threats that they may have looming. And Sandworm Convergence comes in to shorten the clock that we have on them. Next, I played against Mono Red Sneak Attack. Mono Red Sneak is a pretty tough match for us. Luckily for us, we'll usually have enough time to Cabal Therapy more than once, maybe even Collective Brutality and Thought Seize them, to really pick apart their hand and get rid of some of their creatures. Additionally, we have ways to destroy Sneak Attack once it's in play. This means that they have to have even more mana to be able to activate it and play it in the same turn. We also have pretty niche cards like Cast Out and Sandworm Convergence, which stop a lot of their big threats. In the next round, I played against Four Color Loam. This is, again, one of the harder multi-mana based matchups that we can face. Like I said for Punishing Thieves, it's because they've got the Punishing Fire Loop as a way to win with spells, and they can also grind to get there with creatures. We can grind back against the creature strategy, but fighting against both strategies at once is very difficult. 
It's especially difficult because this is a deck that runs Chalice of the Void. Starfield of Nyx comes in since they do have ways of destroying our enchantments and making us discard them. Sandworm Convergence comes in because reliable 5-5 five -five feeders are reliable 5-5 five -five feeders. Grand Seal comes in to turn off Deathrite Shamans. And Golgari Charm helps kill their ley lines. Four Color Loam was my first loss of the day. In the next round, I faced Eldrazi, which was, and still continues to be, one of the decks I have the hardest time playing against with Nyx Fit. We do have the advantage that they have either one or zero basics to go get with Veteran Explorer, but most of their lands tap for two mana or sometimes effectively more. In addition to that, Thought Not Seer is a problem since it permanently exiles cards from our hands, so there's no way for us to get them back. Warping Whale exiles any of the creatures in our deck, which means that we don't get death triggers or the chance to exile them from our graveyard. On top of that, they're also a deck that runs Chalice of the Void to prevent us from playing one drops and can really race us with big, fast, trampling creatures. Playing this matchup really made me regret taking the Swords to Plashers that I used to have in the sideboard out, though with Chalice of the Void it would have been a sketchy proposition either way. This was the second match I lost of the day. In round 5, I faced Mono Red Stompy, or Dragon Stompy, though there really aren't any dragons left in the deck. This is a somewhat rough matchup. With multiple Blood Moon effects, there's actually a measurable impact on our mana base since we do run a handful of Dual Lands and Phyrexian Tower. The biggest things that we have to worry about are obviously the Chalice, as I mentioned from the past couple decks, and Chandra Torch of Defiance. Gaddic T comes in specifically to try and prevent our opponent from casting Chandra Torch of Defiance. Trinisphere can slow us down a little bit, but it's not actually that bad. Cast Out is there to disrupt their prison package, and Ground Seal is there to protect our graveyard. Prison decks in general, though, are not a huge problem for Nyx Fit since not many of them have ways to stop creatures from dying or to deal with enchantments, especially when they're mono red. In round 6, I faced Eldrazi Post just as bad as Eldrazi, but with Cloudpost land base. This allowed the deck to be faster and more ruthless. Thought Not Seer continued to be the bane of my existence for the day, and Chalice of the Void locked out my early game plays and allowed them to secure board advantage. Endbringer also did a great amount of work picking off some of my flying tokens and just dismantling my defenses in general. While overall I think we have a fair chance of beating most Eldrazi decks, I still consider them one of the toughest matches because they can have hands that are both disruptive and fast. We're okay with dealing one of the two, but rarely both at the same time. Definitely bring in Thought Seizes to try and control their hand before they try to control ours, and Cast Out is the most reliable form of removal that we have against them. Just like to the previous Eldrazi deck, I also lost to this one, which knocked me out of Day 2 contention. After the disappointing loss to Eldrazi Post, I decided to stay in and continue playing. In round 7, I faced off against Fish, or Merple. This is one of the better matchups for us. Even though they're very heavy on counter spells, they don't have a whole lot of ways of countering creature spells, and we can live without our non-creature spells resolving. On top of that, they are a deck that is primarily blue, and by primarily, I mean completely blue. This means Choke out of the sideboard is a very, very, very good card. We also have a fair number of ways to answer True Name Nemesis and some of their lords. Overall, the way to deal with fish is to trade even with their creatures as much as you can, or just be willing to throw some of your creatures under the bus until we can start getting out any of our enchantment lock pieces except Dovescape. While Overwhelming Splendor does the most work against fish, Curse of Death's Hold is also very strong. Fresh off a win against Fish, I went into the 8th and final round for me, which was against Elves. Elves is a very interesting deck to look at against Nyxfit. On one hand, it's a combo deck, which means it should be good against Nyxfit. On the other hand, it's a deck that relies on having creatures with abilities, which is bad against Nyxfit. If they go for their plan B of just sort of grinding out with swinging with small dudes, we have ways to deal with that as well. All in all, in terms of all combo decks out there, this is one of the better matchups. The real things we have to worry about are Natural Order, Glimpse of Nature, and Crater Behemoth. To help prevent these sorts of things, we bring in Ground Seals to protect our graveyard from their Deathrite Shamans, Golgari Charm as an emergency way to blow up all of their creatures, and Gaddic Teeth to stop them from casting Natural Order or Green Sunsea. Beating Elves in three really great matches meant I finished Day 1 at 5 and 3. So one of the main reasons why I brought Nyxfit to GP Seattle was I expected to face a lot of Grixis Delver and Chuckpile, two decks that Nyxfit is very well positioned against. Now, I didn't happen to face either of those decks, but I still think it was a very good choice. I didn't make it to day two, but I got about a, as good a record as I could have expected, not as good as I would have hoped. Now, if you want more details about some of those matchups, I tried to do some vlogging over the weekend. It didn't turn out great, but I've left a link to those in the description. 
Um, also, at the end of that, I'm going to be answering a whole bunch of questions that were asked to me on the MTG Legacy subreddit about Nick's Fit as a deck and uh, the pros and cons of it versus Nick Fit and a whole bunch of in-depth questions. So if you're interested in the deck, please go there. I'll also have a typed up version of all of the answers. Um, I just like talking it out first. So that's where that'll be. Um, if you want to see more content like this, I am trying to churn out some more videos more regularly. I've already got another one in the pipeline. should be out within a week or two, so subscribe if you want some more. If the channel can hit 100 subscribers, that's really great. Um, it allows me some more control about not showing ads, so please consider subscribing. Um, and leave some comments if you've got other questions you want answered about Nixfit, or other decks that I've been playing, or other suggestions for decks on what I should be playing, other weird combos I should try making work. Please leave those in the comments, I'm always on the prowl for cool new things to try. So, in short, like, comment, subscribe, you know, the usual stuff. Anyways, I'll see you next time. Have a nice day.